Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our St. Paul City Council Candidate Forum. My name is Jacqueline Kelly, and I'm a League-trained moderator and member. Today's forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul and St. Paul Neighborhood Network. We believe the success of St. Paul depends on values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it is essential for the public to better understand the views and opinions, commitments of people running for elected office in St. Paul. It is this understanding that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions. We appreciate candidates and audience members taking the time to be here tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we, that you all have cards on your chairs uh, for writing questions to the candidates. Once you've had a question, please hold it up and a volunteer will come and pick it up from you. If you'd like to register to vote, stop by the league's table and they will help you do that. This evening's forum is for the candidates running for Ward 7. We have Kartumu King and Jane Prince. The candidates participating in today's forum have all agreed to the forum rules which were included in their invitation to participate. Each candidate will give a two minute introductory statement the candidates will have one minute to answer questions and 30 seconds for rebuttal if necessary. A timer will signal them when they have 30 seconds remaining and when their time is up. We will accept written questions throughout the forum. Questions submitted by the audience must, be, must not be personal in nature and must be on topics relevant for the position. All questions must be addressed to the candidates. Once you have a question written, please pass it up or hold it and an usher will collect it from you. Questions that are of a personal nature, embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be asked. Similar questions may be consolidated and questions may be edited for clarity and brevity. Campaign literature, buttons, signs, clothing, and other campaign related items are not allowed in the room but information on candidates is available at the tables outside of the forum. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. Please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions. Please place your cell phones on silent. Members of the media may be recording this forum for their own use and the forum is being video recorded by the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. With that, we will start with opening statements. Candidates, you each have two minutes for an opening statement. With that, we will begin with Kartumu. After each candidate has a chance to give an intro, be <laughs> we'll begin the question period. <laughs> Hi everybody, how are you guys doing? My name is Kartumu King. I am a mother, a friend, a sister, a community member, and I joined this race on the last day to get on the ballot. My community put me on the ballot. Um, I feel like the residents of St. Paul need their voices to be heard. I've been in spaces, I've learned a lot. I understand government and I would love this opportunity to show the people how we, if we come together, we can empower ourselves and make this city the city that we love, that we all love. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jane Prince and I have been on the council since 2016. I ran for the first time in 2015. And I ran for office because I love St. Paul, I love my community, and there's nothing I'd rather do than serve the community in which I live. I see all of you as my bosses, and I truly mean that. Um, when I came into office, 
one of the things that we as Eastsiders know is that we don't always get the same amount of attention as the rest of the city. And the, in 2008, the city had closed three of our rec centers in Ward 7, all in areas of concentrated poverty. So youth were my focus in my first term. Housing, which um, is a huge issue facing us now, mm -hmm. is my issue going forward. We don't have enough housing for any of our, at any income level, we are short of the supply of housing we need, but especially at the deeply affordable levels. So if I'm lucky enough to be reelected, I would um, put a priority on housing as something that we need to, to build. We need to increase the supply. We need to stabilize housing. We need to make sure that no St. Paul student experiences the trauma of homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. So we're going to start with our first question uh, directed at Jane. If you received a million dollar grant for the city to use any way it wanted, what would you do with it and why? Huh, well that, well for one thing, um, as I said, housing is a huge issue. And a million dollars is, sounds like a lot of money, um, but it doesn't go as far as we would like it to. I think what I would probably do is use it to shine a spotlight and get some action going in the direction of housing students and parents who are homeless in our public schools. What a lot of people don't know and what I want to make clear is that in the 2018-2019 school year, 1,972 students in our St. Paul schools experienced homelessness. Mm -hmm. This is completely unacceptable in our city of St. Paul, where I really believe we take care of each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that a million dollars, if I had it, I would use in that way. Mm -hmm. And same question to you, Kartumo. If I had it, can you read the question? I'm sorry. Absolutely. So if you received a million dollar grant for the city to use any way it wanted, what would you do with it and why? I would build entertainment for the kids and the family. I would, and the reason why I would build something like that is because people would come out They'll have somewhere to go to have fun. They'll be spending their money in the city of St. Paul. We don't have no places really where people could go and just enjoy themselves in the city of St. Paul. Um, movie theaters, we have to go to other cities. And so that will be building our community by Oh, I'm so. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that just um, that, that it would create a space for us and help us build our economy. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So next question um, directed at you, Kartumu. How do we counter the negative impact that neighborhood social media pages often have on public discussion and neighborhood unity? How do we counter the negative impact that neighborhood social media pages often have on public discussions and neighborhood unity? Do they have a negative impact? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not sure whether they have a negative impact or not because I guess social media is a space where people have the opportunity to state their opinion. Mm -hmm. So somebody's opinion might not be the same as yours, but at least they have that space to let others know what they're thinking. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Same question. Um, I really appreciate Kartumu's response here. I do think that social media does give us an opportunity to hear from people in, um, in a way, in the years that I've been in government, that kind of direct feedback from constituents hasn't always been available. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I notice, you know, 
I know that some of my colleagues on the council feel that that ne pages like Nextdoor um, generate a lot of negative feedback and also raise expectations about how quickly things can be addressed. I guess I haven't I haven't been troubled by that. Mm -hmm. I know what they mean. I mean, just going online and getting angry about something doesn't mean that it can immediately be changed. But I feel like, on balance, I think I would agree with Kartumu that it's a really important place for the community to be heard. I will say, because I see we have a member of the media here, that one of the things, oh, okay, I, I, I have to, but I, but I may get back to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So. Jane directed at you again, what specific steps will you support, support to fix our streets and how will you find the money to do so? You know, that, that's a huge problem. And one thing I'll say is, I've been around city government long enough to know that the condition of our streets is something that we could have foretold in the mid 90s when we had mayors in the about 12 years where we had mayors who never raised the property tax levy. Now, I can't get into a big description of how the levy is set, but what we needed to be doing over those 12 years is to be not deferring maintenance, which is what we did. And that deferred maintenance has led to the legacy we are in today of having far, the condition of our streets is far worse than it should be because we deferred maintenance critically from about 1992 until 2005. So I'll, get, I'll try to revisit that. My, I believe my time is up, but we're looking at alternative ways to raise revenue for s streets, and I can talk about that after a bit. And same question to you, Kartumo. What specific, excuse me, what specific steps will you support to fix our streets, and how will you find the money to do so? Okay, so I know that the city of St. Paul is a complaining city. So if you don't complain, they won't come out and do nothing <laughs> about that. So that will be something that we have to change because first you, the people have to understand that they have to complain. A lot of people don't. So we're not gonna put it on the people. The city, we're gonna have people going out and looking at those streets and making sure the maintenance of the streets are well for the people. and. Also, um, as far as far as um, making sure that I'm in contact with uh, PED and making sure that they're working to f to make sure the streets are clean or the streets are fixed and whatever plans they have moving forward, making sure that I have an input in what they're doing and not just what they want to do. So, Kartumo, to you, uh, local governments have a variety of resources that can be utilized to support affordable housing, including public land, tools like tax increment financing, contracts, and more. How would you utilize these resources to support housing needs? So, as far as the land use, local land, um, we will have to find land as the what's available f for us, you know, and once we get that, once we could get a space and we could try to find, one of the ways that I was thinking is finding community, economic development, building community, mm -hmm. having people come together and invest in themselves. So if I, become city council, I will say, okay, I have a certain amount of money that I'm gonna set aside. Everybody can invest in there, so that way we could build more homes, we could go to the land use committee, ask for land, we could build a place, and we can invest in ourselves. I'm sorry, I just lost. <laughs> sure, local governments have a variety of resources that can be utilized to support affordable housing, including public land, tools like tax increment financing, contracts, and more. How would you utilize these resources to support housing needs? You know, 
one of the problems we have as a city is that we have not built deeply affordable housing since the early 2000s. That would be for people who are low-wage workers. It's very hard to afford deeply affordable rentals for housing. And um, what the city has discovered is that tax increment financing is one way that we can generate the funds to get down to the levels of 30% of area median income. Um, we also, we do have land in St. Paul, and we have a variety of funding sources, but one of the factors that we no longer have that we had for 25 years in St. Paul was the McKnight Foundation's Family Housing Fund that gave the cities millions of dollars a year to build affordable housing. Philanthropy needs to come back to the table to get to those very low income levels. Thank you. So, Jane, please describe how you plan to be responsive to your constituents. Um, well, we talked about social media. I, I'm very responsive to social media. I hold a monthly coffee where I get the word out through social media in a variety of ways to let people know where I'm going to be and that they can come and meet with me. I go absolutely everywhere I'm invited. And then by watching to see what events are going on in our community, I show up even at places where I'm not invited, but where I have an opportunity to meet with the community. So I'm constantly out and about. It, it helps that I don't have kids at home, but I am really um, constantly out and about meeting constituents. Thank you. And Karatuma, same question to you. Uh, please describe your plan to be responsive to your constituents. Um, that's one of the things that um, is really kind of sort of affecting me as I campaign. It was when I go out and I engage people and I tell them about the ward that they live in and um, city council and what city council does and how it directly affects them and how they are the boss of, pe the, of the city council mm -hmm. and that's their representation. Like a lot of people don't understand that. So what I do plan to do is educate the people in my ward, in my city, mm -hmm. and so that they can understand how to empower themselves and how we can make this our city. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, the big question. Uh, Kartumu, do you support the current consolidated garbage uh, collection, collection ordinance? I don't. Mm -hmm. I really don't because that's something that I feel people can make their own decisions. You know, they can make their own decisions who they want to pick up their trash. And I had church members who have had the same haulers for years and they have formed a relationship with those people they were sort of kind of like family you know and the fact that you're telling people that they have to use what you want them to use when they have something good let the people make their own choices when they come to their trash seriously thank you same question to you yeah, I I supported having a coordinated hauling system because for a city of our size, I think it's really critical that we know that everybody has trash service wherever they live. I did, when the contract came forward that the city negotiated in November of 2017, I voted against it. It was too expensive for people on fixed incomes and low-income renters. It didn't provide any incentive for waste reduction. And it had already led to the buyout of four small haulers that we had gone into a consortium agreement to keep in business. We had 15 haulers. We had 11 by the time the contract was signed, and we're now down to six. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the program has been problematic, and I also appreciate the fact that the petition um, was done because people felt like the city did not listen to them in terms of the contract that we did enter into. Thank you. So, Jane, to you, in the past few years, St. Paul has seen groups of residents mount substantial opposition to change. How do you make decisions when there is conflict between 
residents who prefer the status quo and residents who prefer a different type of city. You know, one thing that I've discovered in my years of working in government is nobody likes change. And no matter who they are, change is hard to adapt to. So what my belief is in my current job and when I was a legislative aide for 10 years to Jay Beninov on the city council is when a developer would come forward with a project, we always said, the first place you need to go is out to the neighborhood and talk to the neighbors who are gonna be able to say whether they want your project there or not. We actually, when St. Thomas was expanding, there was a huge um, outcry about the, the expansion of their campus. And Jay and I worked for five years with the neighbors out there to work on a plan with St. Thomas that both the neighborhood and St. Thomas could live with. And it was a two block expansion. It was a, it was a really extraordinary thing. I think mediation is something that we should be using, bringing people together to talk about their concerns is Thank important. Thank you. Kartuma, same question to you. In the past few years, St. Paul has seen groups of residents mount substantial opposition to change. How do you make decisions when there is conflict between residents who prefer the status quo and residents who prefer a different type of city? That's kind of like a hard question, but um, engaging the people. Like you said, change is, I cut off my hair yesterday. <laughs> change is, you know, change change is different for a lot of people you know a lot of people wouldn't just cut off their hair you know so like just engaging the people and listening to the people and making sure as you know any decision that you make you're not going to make everybody happy but at least if you give people the opportunity and the chance to voice and you listen and you try to make sure everybody's input is taken in that's that's how we start you know, to make changes. Okay, and Kartumo, to you, again, in your opinion, what is the biggest problem facing St. Paul today, and what can we do about it? The biggest problem facing St. Paul today, I say abuse of power. And it's abuse of power in every sector of government, every sector of people that have power, because they fail to understand or even relate to people and situations. Like, abuse of power is a big problem. I don't know how to really explain it, but it's a big problem. Because the people who have the power are not willing to educate the community on how they can move their power. So that is a huge issue in St. Paul. Thank you. Same question to you, Jane. I, I think as I said earlier that, that the biggest issue facing St. Paul as a community is the shortage of housing at all income levels. Um, our population has now is about as high now as it has ever been at 313,000. And the St. Paul Area Board of Realtors will tell you that even for an executive moving into St. Paul, we do not have a healthy housing market. We have homelessness at levels we've never seen before. And um, as I said earlier, at deeply affordable levels, we have seniors who would like to move out of their homes and free them up for families to move into, but we don't have adequate senior housing so that people can age in the neighborhoods that they now live in. Mm -hmm. So we have got to get serious as a city setting a very aggressive housing development goal and sticking to it. We've got to find more resources and we've got to get it done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So. Jane? This is a big question. What can the city do to address climate change? Well, um, this, this is a big issue. Now we have right now a, a draft climate and resiliency plan 
that is available for, for all of you to download or read online. It is a good ambitious plan that would say that we would become um, carbon free by 2050. The problem with the plan, I feel, is that it's been heavily informed by Excel Energy. Excel, as far as, as um, utility companies across the country, is doing a great job with renewables. Part of its plan is between now and 2050 building gas fracking plants to get the last of the fossil fuels out of the earth. And I think there is no reason that we need to add a step that is gas fracking on the way to moving to renewable energy. So I would like to see us being far more aggressive at the city level on that. Thank you. Cartumo, what can the city do to address climate change? Well, climate change is a big problem. You know, the solar plates are still moving. This is an um, issue that I have been getting some education on. You know, and I think to fully understand what we can do, we got to fully understand what it means for our children and their children when we leave this earth. So just engaging everybody and educating everybody on what we can do as a community to make sure that we leave this world better for our children. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, on the same note, Kartumu, the public is being denied a voice on proposals to fill wetlands and dump pollution into our parkland. Will you work for public input on this matter? Oh, yeah. I'm for the people. <laughs> I'm for the people in every aspect there is to be for the people. They put me on this ballot, and I'm here to work for the people and let their voices be heard. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Same question to you, Jane. Yeah, I, um, I was very surprised to get a... a news of a project that the county had been working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on to build um, islands in Pig's Eye Lake using dredge, dredge spoils. It may be a good idea, but under both the Met Council's 2040 plan and the city's own current plan, any decision like that to, to dump dredge spoils in on the east side in our um, in our already, you know, it's a Superfund site down there that needs to be cleaned up. Anything like that was supposed to go through a public process. So I've been working with neighbors on putting together a resolution calling for a public process for the community to be involved in that discussion. So I, I would continue to, to work on that. Thank you. So Jane, to you, uh, if elected, uh, re-elected, how would you help elderly people age in place? Well, as I said, I was at a housing forum about a month ago in which a realtor in our neighborhood in Dayton's Bluff said, I have dozens of cl clients, elderly people, who want to downsize, and there is no place for them to live in their, um, in their current communities. The other problem is that what is considered affordable right now um, with the funds that we have is 60, the Cambric on 7th Street is 60% is affordable to people at 60% of area median. Mm -hmm. That's $1,100 for a one bedroom unit. So we are not talking about affordable housing. One idea that I have had for Boys Totem Town, and I know that there's a lot of controversy and I'm, I don't want to get out ahead of myself, but I think uh, some type of senior life cycle housing that could be on the footprint of the current um, facility is something that we should be looking at because aging in place housing is something we need in Ward 7. Thanks. Kartumu, same question to you. If elected, how would you help elderly people age in place? Yep, it's as in stay in their current community instead of having to leave their community for facilities or housing or health care. Okay, so it depends on if they want to stay in place, if they want to stay where they are. Um, if their house is paid for and they own it, they should have the opportunity to stay where they are. Um, if... Oh, um, 
as far as their care or just them staying in their homes? And staying in the community, I believe, is the, is the feeling of the question instead of having to leave to get assisted, leave the area or move Who far said away. they have to leave? <laughs> <laughs> Who said they have to leave? I, 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 you know. Yeah, I don't think they shouldn't have to leave just because they're mm -hmm. older, you know. If they wanted to downsize, mm -hmm. if they if wanted to, yeah. right? Okay, because that's the what the question sounds like. Is I know. Sorry yeah. about the confusion for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if they want to downsize. Mm -hmm and move out their house mm -hmm. so we can build facilities for mm -hmm. them in community mm -hmm. where they could still be in community, mm -hmm. but they could downsize. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So, Kartumu, to you, some people feel like the mayor has a blank check from the taxpayers. Do you agree? He has a blank check from the taxpayers, mm -hmm. so he has a check to do whatever he wants to mm -hmm. do. Well, I'm, that's not, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm, I can't answer that question. I apologize, because what do they mean by, like, mm -hmm. I need what he, because. That he can keep raising taxes. Mm -hmm. I think that's. Oh, is that? Idea. Yes. Okay. That's he can keep raising taxes for whatever. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't think that's so, because mm -hmm. I'm sure there's policies that he also has to follow as the mayor as to what he can do and what he can do. Mm -hmm. So, and if, he, if the people feel like he is and they have a problem with it, we can empower ourselves to do something about that, mm -hmm. you know? So if people feel like the mayor has a blank check and he's just doing a whole lot of things that the residents do not approve, us we have the power, we're the people. Mm -hmm. We could say and empower ourselves to make that stop, just mm -hmm. like we just did with the trash. Yep. <laughs> Great, same question to you, Jane. You know, I, I actually used that term um, on September 25th, we were, asked as the council to vote for a, uh, about a 22.5% tax, property tax levy increase that would include 17.4% if the trash referendum is voted down and the city needs to pick up trash and pay for it through the property tax. I don't believe that the city, if the, if the vote is no, I do not believe that we need to put it on the property tax. And I also feel that the idea of our passing a 22.5% levy increase for the second time in three years is just, it's sending a terrible message to taxpayers that we think we have a blank check. Mm -hmm. um, we really need to get real. We're pricing people out of their homes and we need to find a way to run the city more efficiently. Thank you. Okay, so Jane, to you, do you think we need to hire more police officers? You know, the, the issue right now is not whether, and I don't mean to change the question as politicians do, but the issue right now before us is not, are we gonna hire more officers? It's that the mayor's proposed budget had us cutting officers. Mm -hmm. I do not support cutting police officers in St. Paul. I believe that um, Chief Axtell has done a phenomenal job of following through on the goals that he has set for, for his time on, on, on the force of diversifying the department, of getting guns off the street and collect and creating a community engagement unit. I think our cops, especially right now when we're seeing this terrible spike in gun violence, I think the stress that our officers are under is extreme. I don't think it's appropriate for us to be having a discussion about cutting five cops. Whether five cops is gonna make a huge difference or not, I think it sends the wrong message that we should be cutting Thank officers. Right Thank now. you. Kartumu, same question to you. Do you think we need to hire more police officers? <laughs> I have a family member that feels like we should. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's more so to me, like Jane said, it's not about whether we hire more or we cut or we 
fire or we have less. It's about holding the ones that we have accountable and making sure that they they are doing what they need to do. Um, anybody, none of us, I don't think, are police officers, and some of us know police officers, you know, and we understand that it's a hard job. You know, somebody is putting their life at risk every day for us. So we appreciate what the police do, but just making sure that what they are doing are, they're really helping community and not hurting community is what we really need to focus on. Thanks. So Kartumu to you, how would you address homelessness? Buy a big building and move everybody in. <laughs> but um, the thing about homelessness is People get homeless for so many different reasons. You know, um, people get homeless because of they can't pay a medical bill or they lost a job or, you know, it's so many different reasons why people get homeless and everybody needs a home. So we really need to focus on where our dollars are going to the organizations or the people that are saying they are helping the homeless because I just heard there was a lot of money given to an organization for homelessness. Where is that money at? Why aren't we building more shelters? And as far as the shelters, can we cut down some of the criteria to get in these shelters? You know, so those are all different things that needs to be looked at to help us focus on, you know, making homelessness not a problem for us in the city of St. Paul no more. Thanks. So Jane, same question to you. I, th I think um, what Kartumu was referencing is the Department of Human Services. The legislature passed $3 million for homelessness in Minnesota. And the Department of Human Services just, just gave it out in a few different ways. But they gave 600000 to the metro area, none of which includes shelter beds. We have hundreds of unsheltered homeless in our city. The, the, as I said, there's the problem of youth and family homelessness, completely unacceptable. But we need, we need resources. The federal government got out of building public housing in the 80s at the same time that President Reagan stopped funding mental health care at the federal level. So we, we are dealing right now with the legacies of the Reagan administration of really massive homelessness, and we have got to figure it out. But it's, it's as Kartumu said, there are a lot of different causes and they all require different solutions. Thank you. Okay, so Jane, to you, St. Paul has huge opportunities to redevelop the Hillcrest Golf Course, Boys Totem Town, and the former West Publishing site. What's your approach to redevelopment? Well, I'm really excited about Hillcrest. Um, it's the same size as the Ford site. Unfortunately, unlike the Ford site, the east site isn't getting the years of attention of how we're going to plan and, and prepare for the, the Hillcrest site. But I am pleased that the Port Authority has taken the lead on purchasing the site and will be developing half of it with good commercial and industrial jobs. We know that we don't have enough commercial and industrial land in the city. That's going to make a huge difference for creating good living wage jobs. Mm -hmm. The other half of the site needs to be housing, and it needs to be a variety of housing types. Again, senior housing, um, affordable housing at all levels, and, um, and just a variety of densities and so forth. Um, Boys Totem Town, as I said, I think if we do anything there um, in terms of development, we want to retain the, the, the nature that is there and look at potentially uh, senior life cycle housing Thanks. on the same footprint. Same question to you, Kartumu. St. Paul has huge opportunities to redevelop the Hillcrest Golf Course, Boys Totem Town, and the former West Publishing site. What's your approach to redevelopment? Ask the people. <laughs> you know, people that have been living in these neighborhoods have been living in these neighborhoods for a long time. They're, so let's call the community together, ask them what they feel we need in our community for those different sites. Housing, you know, I'm sure everybody will agree will be a great thing, but 
bring the community together. Let's talk about these sites. Let's talk about what, every, what the potential we see as community in redeveloping these sites and build something that the people agree to build, not government. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so Kartumu to you also. Regarding recent killings in St. Paul, what can be done to stop the violence? A lot of praying. <laughs> praying, praying, praying. It's really, really sad what's been going on in the city of St. Paul because somehow, some way, some form, we are all some way related in some way. We know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. So when something like this happens, even though you might not be somebody, as a city, we hurt. Mm -hmm. And even though you might not be connected to that person directly, you're affected in a way. So we, we really need to have opportunities for our children. We really need to be open to engaging with them and really understanding what they're going through because in order for all this to be going on, somebody somewhere is hurting mm -hmm. and we really need to find ways to get to the bottom of that. Thank you. Yeah. Same question to you, Jane. Mm -hmm. um, l last week, I um, went to a meeting that was hosted by the NAACP. The Black Ministerial Alliance was attended by the police and a large number of diverse members of our community at Arlington Hills Lutheran Church. And it was a really hopeful meeting about um, all of us coming together and working across our differences to figure out what the heck is going on here. And, and of course, it's kids, to the extent that there are young people involved, you know, you don't have to think too hard about if a kid is experiencing homelessness, there might be some hopelessness that goes along with that that leads to a careless, making careless and bad choices. Mm -hmm. But we definitely need to work. What, what, was, what made me happy was to see the way in which diverse members of our community came together and really want to work together and work with our police to get it, to, to figure out how to solve this. Thank you. So Jane, also to you, would you commit to opposing any attempt to repeal ranked choice voiding in St. Paul and why? I, I was a strong, I've been a strong supporter of ranked choice voting since before the city passed it. Um, we, we looked at it when I was working on the city council in 2009, and what really turned me on to it was that a high school student by the name of um, Libby Kantner came to my office and talked about how ranked choice voting would lead to more positive, um, a, a, a more positive election process in which candidates would have to be um, like Kartumo and I, really acknowledging each other's strengths and good ideas. And I think, I think that is true, and I continue to support it. And I did fight what was a very um, preliminary effort to work through the Charter Commission to repeal it, and that didn't end up going forward. I, I think ranked choice voting is the future, mm -hmm. um, and I think we ought to be using it at the... Um, DFL endorsement mm -hmm. level as well. Thank you. Same question to you, Kartumu. Would you commit to opposing any attempt to repeal ranked choice voting in St. Paul and why? As far, I don't know, giving people a choice, because at the end of the day, that's all we have in this world is a choice, you know? So I think giving people a choice to rank their their um, candidates is a good thing because if your first candidate don't win, maybe your second candidate win. Because even if you don't get what you voted first for, at least you get somebody that you that you feel will be working for you as a resident. So I like ranked choice, rank choice voting. Thank you. Kartumu, also to you. How can you support our children of color to ensure equal opportunities? By holding the adults accountable, 
to holding the institutions accountable by helping them understand that our children are, are our future. And in order for us to have a good future, we have to be, we have to treat every child equally mm -hmm. and we have to help every child reach their maximum potential by holding ourselves accountable because we are the teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same question to you, Jane. Could you repeat the question? How can you support our children in col of color to ensure equal opportunities? Um, again, when I got into office, I was absolutely stunned that the rec centers that the city decided to close during the recession were, they, we tore down the Margaret Rec Center and we closed Eastview and Highwood Hills, all in the areas of concentrated poverty, all in areas where we have lots of new immigrants and people who really needed those centers to be able to, to, to have their kids be able to spend time with caring adults. So I have succeeded at least in getting Eastview and Highwood Hills open. Um, I think another thing that we've done that I'm a strong supporter of, the, we did away with fines and fees in the, in the libraries. We had blocked cards for 58,000 library users. And when we looked on the map to see where those library users were, they were again in areas of concentrated poverty where a 10 or $20 fine might make the difference. 42,000 of those people are back now since we did away with fines. Jane, to you, uh, St. Paul created an affordable housing trust fund in 2019, which includes two million of ongoing funding through neighborhood star funds. Considering the housing needs in St. Paul, do you think this amount is sufficient? No, I mean, $10 million is definitely a move in the right direction. One of my friends who ran for mayor said, isn't it funny that we spent 22000 to build infrastructure around Alliance Field and we're putting $10 million into housing in St. Paul, which is so vitally needed at all income levels? And I would have to agree with that, but $10 million is definitely a step in the right direction. And what we learned when um, we did Housing 5000 in the early 2000s was any amount of money that the city can put on the table is really important to leveraging private dollars, philanthropic dollars, bringing um, nonprofit developers to work with for-profit developers. So it's a great, 10 million is a great way to leverage mm -hmm. funds to get housing built. But again, we're not moving fast enough and I'm really concerned about that. I think we need to set an aggressive housing goal. Thank you. Khartoum, uh, same question to you. St. Paul created an affordable housing trust fund in 2019, which includes $2 million of ongoing funding through neighborhood star funds. Considering the housing needs in St. Paul, do you think this amount is sufficient? No, it's a start, but it's not sufficient. So we have to, real, we have to try to find other ways to help bring more money in when it comes to housing. Um, is there a way that we can up that amount? You know, is there, can we work with community members and, and build a program or something where if you're investing in that program, if you're putting money up in that program that we can help build you a house? You know, just throw around different ideas to help increase the funding for housing. Okay, Kartumo, to you. How do you work with community members when their opinions uh, differ from yours? Understanding, being open. You know, people are different. That's what makes us beautiful, you know. So to be open and to listen to what somebody else might think is the right thing, whether you agree or not, is a beautiful thing. Um, giving everybody a chance, you know? We're never gonna agree to everything because 
it depends on what you've been through and what I've been through. But being open and being understanding and knowing that there is a different way to do something and giving our people the opportunity to open up to you is a beautiful thing. Thank you. Jane, same question to you. You know, I can give an example of when, when I was first on the council, we voted to, um, on an ordinance to change the police internal affairs review commission and the board had been made up of two police officers and seven citizens and um, it was going to change to seven nine citizens and two police officers and and i supported having officers on the commission and i still do in my head but about 50 people of color in my community asked for a meeting with me in a church basement and they explained, we did a circle process and they talked about the fact that there was no way given the experience of their family members or themselves with police in various settings, not necessarily in St. Paul, but they'd never be able to have trust for a commission that included officers. And while I had been trained in mediation I have to stop. In any case, um, I changed my vote on it to, to say mm -hmm. um, there shouldn't be officers on the commission. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Jane, to you, in your opinion, how does street design correlate to economic health in a business community? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I think one of the things that we all know is traffic moves too fast and one of the priorities that the city has come out with a pedestrian plan that says that city street our street should be designed putting pedestrians first bikes second um, transit third and cars last um, i think i agree with that um, i we're in the process one of the things that i've been able to do and it was supposed to happen this fall was we were about to put a um, hawk light in on 7th Street where there is a business district, Mississippi Market, and the coffee shops and commercial buildings there. And it, it will go in, but it's a pedestrian activated red with a um, safe harbor in the middle of the street. And I think it's critical that, that pedestrians feel safer on our streets, I, and also the move to 25 miles an hour in St. Paul, I think, is the right one. Same question to you, Kartumo. In your opinion, how does street design correlate to economic health in a business community? Um, it's a big, big deal. Um, earlier this year, I was in a meeting where the city was um, changing up the streets, and the small businesses that were in the meeting were upset because the street design wasn't to benefit them. It was to benefit people that are organizations that they thought had better relationships with the city. You know, so these small businesses over here on the east side, they need to be involved with these designs, you know, because how your street is designed could um, affect how much business you do get. So bringing in the small business owners and allowing them to give their input on street designs and what they think will work for them to elevate their business will be a great thing. And street designs does play a big part in where your business is located. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Kartumu, to you, how would you support small businesses? By giving, allowing them to understand all the opportunities that the city has for them. One of the big things that I have noticed um, working in the spaces I've been working in and being in the meetings that I've been in, the information that is needed for people to elevate themselves are not being given to them. Um, the city says, oh, we have this program, we have this program, but are you really engaging the people? Are you really telling them, are you going out there and talking to small businesses and letting them know, oh, if you, you could get a $10,000 grant just for holding a recycling um, in, 
a recycling what is it uh, trash a recycling and a compost in your in your um, business that's an opportunity that a lot of small businesses don't know of you know and the people who are supposed to let these that's why when I say abuse of power that's what I meant <laughs> in a lot of the, the people who are supposed to be letting these small businesses know of the opportunities that they have are not doing so you know and Jane, same question to you. Yeah, Kartumu's right. Um, one of the things, I, I heard that a lot when I was campaigning in 2015, and um, a couple of my council colleagues and I launched the Open for Business initiative, where what we've been trying to do is work directly with our business communities to figure out what they want. Um, it, the process was really opaque about how you open a business in St. Paul. In working with the innovation team um, and with businesses, we put together a guide on opening a business in St. Paul that has been translated into four languages. Um, it's not perfect yet. We're working on improving customer service. And when I was working on the $15 minimum wage, I discovered that the Citizens League hadn't met with the immigrant business owners and, and own, businesses owned by people of color on the east side were not part of the process. And so working with the East Side Area Business Association, we were able to convene those meetings and make changes to the ordinance based on their needs. Thank you. So Jane, to you, how can the city council work with the school district to make sure they are supported in equity? Um, well, one way that the, the city is working with the school district right now is that when, when I started working with the community members who brought to my attention the homeless problem in our public schools, I, um, we convened a cross-sector group of government, community, and school officials. Um, and we are working really closely with Project REACH, which is the, the group that works directly with homeless um, students and families and as a result of that Mayor Carter is using part of the um, housing trust fund to create a, a rent supplement program for school families that are um, at risk for eviction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Same question to you Kartumu. How can the City Council work with the school district to make sure they are supported in equity? Well um just how can the city council work with the school board? Um, first of all, the city council has to understand um, the needs of the school in the different areas in St. Paul and hold the school board accountable and help build equity by really dealing with um, the different schools that are in need, you know, because depending on what part of the city you're staying in, you might have more equity than others. So just focusing on those who need to be elevated a little bit more. Thank you. Um, to you also, Kartumu, what can the city council do to provide opportunities for at-risk youth? What can the city council do? Mm -hmm. At risk use, at risk of what? Mm -hmm. Is just anything? I think, yeah, I think anything. Mm -hmm. The city has to engage the youth more. Like, you know, having a forum like this mm -hmm. with the youth, mm -hmm. all youth, all ages, you know, telling you what they feel, what they think. You know, I feel like for every board and commission that the city has, there should be a children or a youth or a child board and commissions because a lot of the decisions that we're making as adults, they are being affected by it, you know? So we need to create spaces for them to be open and tell us what they think because we were all children once and that's, we all think we're smart. So just imagine if we give children the opportunity to really open up and voice their opinion, how much difference we can make by changing their view of life. Thank you. 
Same question to you, Jane. What can the city council do to provide opportunities for at-risk youth? Um, well, the, the getting the rec centers back open was one really vital move um, that, that I was able to assist with. We were also, I also realized that the city, the Parks and Rec Department for years had a scholarship program for families to use if they couldn't afford programs. And I looked at the use of the scholarship program in the rec centers, were, which had the highest, um, were in the areas of concentrated poverty, and it was zero. Because in a lot of rec centers, the kids come in without their parents, and they're not, kids are not applying for scholarships. So we created a, a, a several hundred thousand dollar fund over a couple of years with Mayor Coleman and Mayor Carter to fund free and reduced cost programming for um, kids in our rec centers where a parent doesn't have to intervene to fill out a form. Mm -hmm. We also have the Right Track program which is providing job experience to kids at the city and in businesses in St. Paul. Thank you. So this is the last question uh, to you, Jane. What do you want your legacy to be? Um, you know, I guess I, I guess it would be important for me to feel like we had made progress as the East Side. You know, the question was asked about Pig's Eye and the riverfront down there and the ways in which the East Side has been literally a dumping ground. Um, I, I guess one of my, I would like my legacy to be that we have the the part of town that is among the most multiculturally diverse areas in the metro area. And I think we have an opportunity working together, as Kartumu talks about, of really being able to lift everybody up together mm -hmm. and make the east side a place that really works, where we, we create good affordable housing and good jobs for the people who live here and we become a successful community that is a model, not just for the metro area, but is really for our state and nation. And uh, we cannot, we have to fight back to the. Mm -hmm. so, same question to you, Kartumu. Uh, what do you want your legacy to be? <laughs> They're right there, <laughs> my children. <laughs> but uh, I want my legacy to, or as far as city council, I want, the reason why I'm even sitting here at this table is because I want people to understand their power. I want people to understand that city council works for you. You are the decision maker. In our lifetime, it always, it feels like we're always doing, we're always working for others, but this is a situation where the people get to decide who they want to represent them. And as your city council member, that's the person who is supposed to fight for you when you can't fight no more. That's the person that's supposed to make sure that your life is comfortable, you know? So as far as my legacy, I just want people to stand up, you know, stand up and I want them to know that you do have the power and I'm here to show you how you can empower yourself because you are the one that can make this happen. Thank you. So that was our last question for the candidate forum. I'm gonna give each candidate, uh, starting with Jane, an opportunity to make a closing statement. After that, we have Fair Vote Minnesota here to say a few things about uh, ring choice voting. Okay, Jane. Thanks. You know, when you, I've only been in office for four years and I like to think that I haven't gotten that I haven't turned into a politician, but it's been really humbling to sit here with Kartumu and have her first response be on every question. Well, I would listen to the people. And I realized that my knee-jerk first response was to come up with an answer. Um, I, I believe that I have, um, that I, that I always try to put the people first and I am thankful to Kartumu for running and for making me remember that and for making me realize that um, the answers come from all of you. And, and I'm, Kartumu had originally 
been part of my campaign. And she came to me and said, you know what? I'm getting into this race. And I so respect and admire her um, for doing that and, and her courage. And I uh, thank you for reminding me who I work for. Cartoon went to you, closing statement. Um, this opportunity that God has pushed me off the last for is an amazing opportunity. The fact that I am asking 50,000 people to hold me accountable and help bring them some type of joy is amazing to me like this i this is what i like to do helping people helping people is what i like to do i understand that we're all different and you got to meet people where they are mm -hmm. but as a city if we want to be a great city that we are we have to educate the people mm -hmm. we have to let people know the opportunities you know and when I say abuse of power, my aunt always shake her head, but it's abuse of power on all levels. When you do anything to stop people from reaching their full potential and you have the power, that's abuse, you know? So all the, the only thing that I stand on is community, and I'm fighting for community, and I want people to realize that they have the power. They make the decisions. Everybody in the government works for you, you know, and what I have started to realize is a lot of people in government has forgotten who their boss are, you know. They feel like because they're in the situation, they get to make the decision. And whatever place you are in government, the people that you're supposed to serve are the people because they could take you out that seat with no problem. And that's what I want to help, help educate them and empower them to understand that they have the power. We the people, it goes a long way, but we have to come together. We have to understand what we're fighting for, and we have to vote. <laughs> we have to. Thank you both for being here tonight. We appreciate that so much, and a few words from Fair Vote, Emin. Hi everyone, my name is Mai Yi and I am a community organizer with Fair Vote Minnesota. So Fair Vote Minnesota is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization and their focus is on reforming the electoral system. And their method is um, advocating for ranked choice voting. So, um, you know, as a community organizer, this work is very important to me. Two years ago was my first time um, learning about local elections. You know, I was 24 and I never knew what is a city council, what is a mayor. Um, so two years ago when I heard about that there's a mayoral um, election a race going on um, and then I have also the choice to rank my candidates. And that's how I learned um, about local elections and about this new voting method that makes me feel very hopeful that I don't d just get to choose one, but I get more choices to vote for people who actually are running for office that are reflecting the values that I care about and will be fighting issues that I care about. And so that's why I'm also uh, for ranked choice voting. And um, I have a script here that I usually follow, but um, again, like this work is very important to me. Um, when I was community organizing two years ago, I realized how many people are left out, how many people are still uh, not understanding the voting process, not, not knowing who is running for office. And so that's why I do the work that I do going out to the community like this and educating people that, hey, there are people running for office um, and we need to participate in voting because voting is is what makes our voice um, be heard. And it's what we're electing people to be in office to make our own decisions for our, that are impacting our everyday lives. So, um, 
So as you may know, the city council race is a ranked choice voting one. That means you get to rank all of these candidates in the order that you like them the best. If your first choice doesn't have enough votes to go on, your vote will transfer to your second choice. Your second or third choice never harms your first, and ranking the same candidate multiple times does not help them. So it always maximizes your voice and power to rank your ballot. So today, after listening to these two candidates um, and talk about what they're fighting for, what they stand on, listen not only to who your favorite may be, but how you might like to rank them. And if, if you have any more questions about how ranked choice voting works, um, I'm going to be over there. You can come to me and talk to me about it. I also brought literature that has that provides information about ranked choice voting as well. I also brought out forms where if you're interested in voting by mail, I have that as well. And if you're not registered to vote yet, I also have those forms as well. So thank you so much. With that, tonight we conclude. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>